Hi, Simon Jacobson here. Welcome to another episode of A Meaningful Live. Rosh Hashanah in Time of War. This program is dedicated in honor of Mark Sava with gratitude and warm wishes on his birthday. I'd rather not be talking about war, but the reality on the ground and in the air, I mean, look what's just happening literally as we speak. Over 180 ballistic missiles fired from Iran on Israel. And who knows what's coming next? Clearly, there's war. And the interesting thing, I don't even know if the word interesting is the right word, but the convergence of all that happening, right as we are about to close the chapter, the curtain coming down on this faithful, difficult year, the Hebrew year, and entering the new year of Rosh Hashanah, the new year. And it's not just a new year, it's the birthday of the human race. So it's a day of destiny. So how do we look at it? The paradoxes. On one hand, such a beautiful holiday, beginning of a new year, a new chapter, a new era, a new, new possibilities, new energy, as the mystics say. A new energy enters into the world, into our personal lives. And then we see the pain, the darkness, the senseless killings, hatred, and, of course, the convergence with the first anniversary of October 7th, which will be two days after Rosh Hashanah. It happened last year, it was Simchas Torah and Shemini Yatzeret, the end of the holiday season that begins on Rosh Hashanah, but the secular anniversary is uh, on the 5th of Tishrei, literally three days after Rosh Hashanah, two, three days after Rosh Hashanah. The mixed feelings... On one hand, so many deaths, brutality, atrocities, families shattered, hostages that are still suffering, awaiting their their fate. So our prayers and our blessings and our hearts and souls go out to each one of them, including the soldiers, the young soldiers fighting the war, and to all the innocent people. Just today, millions of people ran into shelters because of these missiles. So sadly, this is not the first time we've had to deal with this paradox. The Jewish people in particular have been going through this time and again for centuries, for millennia. Go back to the story in Egypt, Egyptian exile, under the Babylon, under the Assyrians, under the Babylonians, under the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, you name it, the different host countries that expelled, discriminated, killed, pogroms, crusades, and of course the Holocaust. And yet we are here with a tremendously indestructible, resilient spirit. How do you do that? Because we look at the new year, Rosh Hashanah, we look at other special days, and we don't see them as either or. It's not like a zero-sum game. It's either all celebration or all tragedy. We look at the tragedies in the face. We peer into the abyss, and we become stronger for it, because we realize that we have something greater that no enemy and no death and no violence and no darkness can extinguish, and that is the divine spirit within each of us, the divine destiny. And when you can hold on to that, it doesn't minimize, it doesn't weaken the challenges we face, but it gives you an additional resource. That's the ultimate way you win wars. Not just with great skill and strategy and and military and technology, which Israel, of course, is blessed with, and brilliance, but it's also with that deep connection. Because you can have all the great armies in the world, and if you don't have the conviction, and if you don't have that spirit, no, you may not win that war. And that has always been our challenge. So yes, on October 7th, terrible things happened. But we danced. Not because we're in denial, or a form of dissonance, or a form of escapism. is because dancing is not denying the realities of life. 
it's part of appreciating that life is complex and in order to achieve the ultimate purpose of the divine creation, to create a home for the divine, we need to experience darkness. That doesn't mean we need to experience that level of darkness, but we need to know that we live in a world where there's a potential for choosing life or choosing the opposite of life. And then you shall choose life as the Bible, the Torah tells us. So when you come from that type of place where you're in a sense where the soul, before it comes into this world, is already trembling, recognizing that it's going from a beautiful spiritual oasis, a spiritual environment into a difficult, hostile world where there is, yes, divisiveness and there's hatred and there's pain and there's suffering and there's discrimination. So the soul is quite, quite aware of where it's entering and that's why it's not so easy for the soul to enter this world. But it knows I have something stronger within me. So let's look at the events. Today as we're all watching and seeing those missiles, seeing the images, is it not a miracle? that 180 ballistic missiles and almost no casualties? More casualties in the attack in Jaffa near Tel Aviv this, today from some Palestinian in the actual territories of Israel than all these missiles? And this is not the first time. A few months ago when Iran sent off more missiles and drones, similar. Is that not a miracle? So we'll say it's the technology. Yeah, but technology is also a miracle, especially when you couple it all together, you look at all the factors. So we recognize that. But at the same time, we're not dependent on miracles and we're not looking just for a miracle. So when you know that you appreciate and have gratitude for the blessings in your life, you have something to celebrate on this Rosh Hashanah. At the same time, we also know we have the resources and the strengths and all the tools necessary to fight off the evil in our midst. So that's lesson number one, that, that we shouldn't be afraid of paradoxes, the paradoxes of life. And you look at, even on an individual level, the secret, whenever you see anyone who suffered greatly, why do some people fall apart and their life is one of complete bitterness and anger and they can't function? And others suffer equally, and yet they have that additional strength. It's exactly that. It's not because they suffer less. It's because, Viktor Frankl put it, they have a sense of meaning, man's search of meaning. They have a sense of purpose. So it's not less suffering, but they have an additional resource to counter it. And that resource actually makes them stronger in the process. As I've repeated a number of times, the Jewish people are like a tea bag. You don't know how strong they are until you put them into hot water. Now, we don't want the hot water, and we don't want that. But if it comes our way, we access and we dig deeper, and we find that deeper resilience, and we become stronger people. Look, the Renaissance of Israel, the Renaissance of Jewish life after World War II, is that not a testimony? Now, again, we all hoped it would have been over, but we still have the hatred. We have an Iran who's trying to use its proxies but you've also seen the miracles, the miracles the last few weeks. I know some people find it odd that Israel sometimes it seems to be completely off base and then suddenly shows genius in a strategic, surgical way of dismantling Hezbollah and its leadership. We all pray that it should be now extended to Hamas in Gaza and to Iran. And we're fighting a war, which brings me to the next point. This is not just about that inner resilience for ourselves. We're fighting a war for the world. This is, yes, a global conflict. It is about morality. It is about what is right and what is wrong. Explain to me the senseless, irrational hatred of Iran. Why would a country spend billions of dollars to create proxies in the first place who would build tunnels just to be everything they can do possible to destroy the state of Israel, the country of Israel, the land of Israel, the Jewish people. Why? It literally can be equated with the irrational hatred of the Nazis to the Jews. What did we do to them? Now, I know there's all the arguments and the narrative that, the, that Israel came in and displaced the Palestinians. So first of all, we know Israel is, is, is a land 
of Jewish land that's here long before Palestine existed, long before Muslims existed, long before Arabs existed. It goes back all the way to Abraham. But I don't want to make that case right now. It's not important. What did they do? What did the Jews do to them that deserve this type of hatred? Let's get back to the root. What do they do? And what do they want? Well, they tell us what they want. So this isn't just a battle for the Jews versus their enemies. It's a battle for righteousness versus evil. Yes, in the beginning you could have said the Nazis, all they did was targeted Jews. But then we saw it wasn't just Jews. Then they attacked France. That, well, let's start with Poland. Czechoslovakia, Poland, France, Great United Kingdom. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the United States. It begins, like we know, the miners' canary. It may begin with the Jews, but it always extends. Hatred is hatred. Why the world does not appreciate that is very disturbing. Literally, an impotent leadership in the United States, in Europe. These are terrorists that have attacked your people, your citizens, American citizens, European citizens, and continue to attack, and say clearly that's what they want to do. Thank God Israel has woken up. So that's lesson number two, and that's what we also take strength. So Rosh Hashanah comes, and we're told this is the birthday of the human race, the birthday of every human being on this earth, Christian, Muslim, Jew, Buddhist, whoever, belief, no belief, people of faith or no faith, the collective human race, time to ask ourselves and take an accounting on your birthday. Why are you here? And I say this to all my brothers and sisters on earth to all my fellow citizens, and to my Muslim cousins as well. Why are you here on earth? Why did God put you here? That's what Rosh Hashanah's question is. And when you betray yourself, God asks each one of us, Ayeka, like he asked Adam in the Garden of Eden, where are you? I don't recognize you. You've betrayed yourself, you've betrayed your cause, you've betrayed your very purpose. The purpose is to come to this world and yes, be diverse, but find harmony within your diversity. What did your great-grandfather Abraham teach you? This is the question of Rosh Hashanah, and that's what we enter into. And Rosh Hashanah, we're told, the destiny of nations is determined. Yes, the destiny of nations. In addition to the destiny of each one of us. So when we go into Rosh Hashanah in time of war, with all the challenges, we also go in with tremendous confidence, supreme confidence that the destiny of all nations will be determined, but we have to do our part. Her God is watching. He has sent us these great leaders like Abraham, and I mean Abraham from the Bible, and the great leaders that followed him, Abraham and Sarah, and Moses, and all the leaders to teach us what is our purpose in this world. Now, when there are those that so so betray that purpose to the point they're ready to kill and, and indiscriminately shoot missiles at innocent people. You know there's a, a major issue going on. Civilians killed, we all are appalled by that. But Israel has been targeting the enemies. The enemies have embedded themselves and surrounded themselves with civilian shields. But that's what Israel has been targeting. That point is not really made that often. Iran just sends missiles into a country without not targeting any particular military installation or military leader. I'm not just trying to justify that either. But it tells you immediately who, who these people are and what they want. But the destiny of nations are determined. So even when we went through the darkest, we knew the destiny of nations are determined. Unfortunately, there were years where that determination did not necessarily materialize into a way that we found it. I mean, I, people that I know that were in the Holocaust and Rosh Hashanah, they prayed for the fall of these evil nations and it didn't happen immediately. But now, I think we see signs, positive signs, but we still have to fight the war, both the physical war and the military, the military war and the spiritual war. And the final point I want to make a Rosh Hashanah message is in addition to light being stronger than darkness, to our looking at our birthday, collective birthday, and what is our destiny, where do we stand, how are we behaving, the point of war itself. Nobody likes war. 
well, I should say, nobody, no decent person likes war. The Torah, the entire Judaism is built on peace. The whole Torah was given nothing but to bring peace to the world. It's the greatest blessing. Shalom. So you would think that means, by all means, you have to avoid war. Bloodshed. No, it's not about turning the other cheek. If an enemy comes your way, then actually war becomes peace. I don't want to paraphrase 1984 because it's used in a very distorted way. But when you have an enemy, a sworn enemy, threatening you and your family, then self-defense is actually peaceful because you're eliminating an enemy that's ready to attack you. If you fight that war halfway, then you're not bringing peace. And we go back to the World War II example. It's mind-boggling. Germany, do you know the hatred that they spewed? To the Jews for sure, but in general? And that today, 80 years later, a Nazi ideology is forbidden to be taught in their schools, and that Germany is an ally to Israel, an ally to the United States, to the Western world? I'm not saying every German, everyone in there is a perfect person. I'm sure there's plenty of anti-Semitism. But who would have believed that? And you know why it happened? Because there was no conditional surrender. There was no ceasefire. There was no peace, premature peace declared until there was a total victory with unconditional surrender of the enemy. Because that's what you need when you have an enemy of that level that's ready to do anything, to destroy anyone then the only way to deal with it is absolute victory. And the only response you want to see is, is, is unconditional surrender. You'd think, let them save some face, a little pride. Give them already conditional surrender. They've already been destroyed. Berlin was completely demolished, completely bombed out. No. A loser needs to know they're a loser. You brought on this evil to this world. Now you're a loser. The winner wins and dictates the terms. And those terms create true peace and lasting peace. It's hard to imagine when you see this, this, the, the vitriol, the venom spewed by Muslims, Muslim fundamentalists against Israel. Just listen to some of the translations of some of these so-called leaders. You think they never could be changed. It's not nothing less than Hitler. And yet, the lesson we learn is that when you go and you fight the good fight for the right reason, you're not fighting to kill anyone. You're fighting for the right reason. You're fighting to kill someone who wants to kill you. Then that is actually the path to peace. The world wants peace. That's what... Now, obviously, it's been established who you're dealing with. But this idea of appeasement, as Churchill put it, appeasement is feeding the crocodiles and the hope you'll be eaten last. This ideal, uh, the idea of appeasement and keeping things, let's not rock the boat, you know, the, the sad joke would they say the two Jews are about to be killed by the Nazis and one of them starts speaking and the other guy says, don't speak, you, you'll get us into trouble. That's a delusion. And it's pretty clear what's happening. When you see Americans and Europeans and others who've been killed by terrorists and it continues, it's just a matter of time. This isn't just Israel's problem, as I mentioned before. So it's recognizing that sometimes you need strength to achieve peace, true peace, lasting peace. So as we about, as the curtain is about to come down on this year, and a new curtain rises on the new year, and the destiny of nations and of people are determined, may it be a year of true peace, a year of true strength, a peace among all human beings, all over the world. Yes, an eradication of those that oppose that. In a world like ours, we've come to discover there are people who oppose freedom. And to me, it appears, I think everyone is seeing it, that the enemy is very weak. They're making noise, trying to save face, trying to demonstrate they have some strength, but they've been exposed. They've been defanged. And the world can thank Israel for exposing that. But now let's finish the job and bring peace to the entire world. I would wonder if most of the Iranian population, what they think, if they were allowed to speak up. That there would be peace between them and Israel. True peace. Peace between Saudi Arabia and the other countries in that region. And we can actually march in to a world of personal and global redemption. 
Doesn't seem so obvious right now. But we're right near that threshold. But we have to stand strong and we have to be clear. And our main focus has to be on bringing the light and the morality and the virtues and the values that we all cherish and stand for. And that will dispel the darkness. Meanwhile, we have to fight the fight and do whatever it takes, militarily and every other possible way, to eliminate any threat against innocent people on this earth. Be blessed with a good year, a happy year, a peaceful year, a sweet year. May this anniversary of October 7th serve as both a reminder of how dark it can get, but also a reminder of how bright it can become and the power that we have to choose life, to choose light. And that power is stronger than any darkness and any violence out there. May it be quickly and even before the new year. Shana Tova, happy year to all of you. This has been Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com. Please subscribe to our offerings, to our YouTube channel. Please share. Please share your comments as well and feedback. Look forward to continue this important programming, especially in a time of year like this, especially during the events that are going on, these critical events, this urgency out there. And as we enter the new year, I also invite you to please partner with us in every possible way, including financially. Be generous, donation that can help us. We are a nonprofit. All our programs are, are made possible by listeners, viewers like yourself. Go to MeaningfulLife.com slash forward slash donate. And may God bless you in turn and be charitable with you as we enter this new year. Thank you so much. Be blessed. Be well. Shana Tovah.